I'm Lucy Calkins, and I'm the founding director of the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project. And oh, thank you, children. <laughs> and it's an organization that works to create state-of-the-art literacy instruction across New York City, the nation, and the world. And as part of what I do, I work a lot with book people, with authors, with editors. Editors like Emily Robert, Jennifer Roberts, who's the wonderful person from Candlewick who may help to make this day happen. And I work also with publishers, and among the publishers, one of them is Candlewick, which has this amazing, amazing net knack of putting books into the hands of people, books that bring, help kids to read not only for plot, but also for beauty and for significance. Today, it's my honor to do some introductions. And first of all, I want to explain how the, the, our time together will go after our presentation. The before discussion and questions, a group of young people from Clinton Middle School will present an interpretation of Ladder to the Moon. And we're so glad that they are here with their wonderful teacher, Emily Campbell. So we thank them for coming. And then after, after, my, after that, there will be time for some questions and discussion, and we will adjourn across the hall for book signing. It's now my honor to introduce Susan Furman, the president of the college, and to just tell you a little bit about, for those of you, anybody here who doesn't know Susan well, to tell you a little bit about her, and she will introduce our speaker. And I guess what I want you to know about Susan is that it's such a, a joy to me to have a leader of this organization, this college, that, that understands that Teachers College needs to be like those storyteller dolls. You know the storyteller dolls that have seated on their arms and their back and their shoulders, all, these, all the children? Well, Susan's image of Teachers College is that Teachers College doesn't just have seated on our arms and our back and our shoulders and our lap, it doesn't just have individuals, it has whole schools, whole districts of schools, whole cities of schools, whole nations of schools. This for Susan is not just a, a um, organization organizational mission, it's a very personal mission. And Susan came to Teachers College, the very first day that she came to Teachers College, she came talking about the fact that Teachers College needed to have on our arms, on our shoulder, on our back, we needed to have a school of our own. And since she's come here, one of the most important sort of personal projects to her has been creating a public school that is the Teachers College Public School. So just this week, Teachers College is announcing that we are beginning a school in Harlem, that it will be a public school, that it will be, that it, that it will be open by lottery um, to all of the children of the neighborhood. And it's so sort of magical that is happening on this same day as this incredible event is happening. And to top it off, today is Susan's So the birthday girl, I have a present for you, Susan, and I bet you can't guess what it is. Susan will introduce our speaker. So Lucy, that was lovely. I'm going to be surprised that you mentioned my birthday. I have to say I knew. <laughs> you were going to, but I was incredibly touched by your other words, and um, it's so wonderful to hear uh, that this mission is so widely shared. I knew it was important to you, but it's great to have you reflect it back. Uh, we're all very excited about the opening of our new school, about our relationship with other schools in Harlem, about our living up to our commitment as a and as a place of learning to engage as much as possible with um, those from whom we can learn and to whom we can um, work, with whom we can work on um, many the uh, uh, aspects of our mission. So, yes, it's my birthday, and when it is your birthday, no matter how old you are, and I will not divulge that, um, <laughs> you think back, of course, through your whole life, and uh, remember birthdays past and, and your childhood, and you certainly do think many times you have read a story. Um, I know that's prominent in everybody's memory, just like mine. Stories have magical powers to 
the imagination and open up entire worlds to young minds. And when I think of reading a story, I think of Lucy Calkins, because for the past 30 years, Lucy has been an educational Johnny Appleseed. Uh, through the reading and writing project, she has helped teachers throughout New York City across the nation see the love of language and literature in uh, young minds. And Lucy, we want to thank you for that priceless gift. Tonight's special guest comes bearing her own priceless gifts, the gift of teaching and the gift of storytelling. She has certainly enjoyed a story life and career. Maya, Maya Sutoro Ng was raised partly in Hawaii and partly in Indonesia. She attended college as an undergraduate, earned a master's degree in English from NYU, although we learned tonight that she took some courses here as well. Welcome back, <laughs> Maya, and a PhD in comparative international education at the University of Hawaii. She has taught history at the college and K-12 levels, including at the Learning Project and Alternative Middle School here in New York City. She and her husband, Conrad, a professor of creative media at the University of Hawaii, have two daughters of whom they are very proud, Suela and Savita. She's also proud of her brother, who's done pretty well for himself. <laughs> Maya is here to talk about a wonderful children's book, Ladder to Learn. Uh, speaking as a grandmother who's been reading a lot of children's books aloud uh, for the last few years, I'll tell you that Ladder to the Moon moved me deeply, just about to tears. I don't want to steal the author's thunder, but uh, I'd like to share two indelible impressions. The first is that a notion of a young granddaughter brought together with a recently departed grandmother through the magical adventures in a dream. So here I'm hooked. I told Maya I have three sons, and then I got my, got my granddaughter, uh, with whom I'm exceedingly close. I think about her. Uh, I don't want to be the recently departed grandmother. <laughs> we have lots of life together. We do have a special connection. I can't leave out my grandson. He's terrific, too. But um, The other question that stayed with me was the image of um, the two, the grandmother and daughter sitting together on the moon as the child learns of the great and need in the world beneath them. And uh, learns she does uh, skillfully and imaginatively. The book touches on adversity and disasters of great magnitude. The child hero, along with young readers, emerge more aware of the nature of the world we live in, but less hopeful about the future. This is a book to read moments of sadness or trouble, but it's also a book that's full of joy. It's a powerful story, beautifully told, and ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Maya Sutoro. One cool evening, Sheila asked her mama, what was Grandma Annie like? She was like the moon, her mother replied, full, soft, and curious. Your grandma would wrap her arms around the whole world if she could. Mama gave Suhela a hug. You have Grandma Annie's hands, she said. Later, Suhela lay in her pajamas. The moonlight coming through her open window. She looked at her hands, front side and back, and wondered what else she had gotten from her grandma. As the night deepened and the crickets grew loud, Suhela wondered and waited. It seemed like something was about to happen. Then, as though in answer to her wondering, a golden ladder appeared at the edge of the sill. And there, of course, on the lowest rung was Grandma Annie. And she beckoned to Suhela, and she said, come, let's have an adventure. And Suhela tosses herself out of bed and joins her grandmother. And together, hand in hand, they climb to the moon where Grandma Annie jumps first and her lap gets wider and wider, bigger than the biggest moon crater. And this is all so Suhela will have a soft place to land. And it was that sort of steady, really intense and powerful uh, love that she gave us that made us brave about our own paths and our own uh, decisions. And when I was pregnant with my daughter, I thought about that and how much I wanted that for my daughter and for my nieces. And I came across books in my grandmother's storage locker, and the books um, contained 
I said books, but you know, it was toys as well. It contained the stories of our childhood. And these books were treasures that were given to me by my mother for my children in the hopes that I could share those stories that meant something to us. And I thought, you know what, I can't be content simply you know, to give these artifacts to my daughter. I also have so many memories and, and uh, uh, so many stories of my own that I want to share with them. And that made me brave about my own storytelling. The two looked back towards Earth, and Suhela tried to be brave about feeling so far from home. What fun, said Annie. What now, asked Suhela. Listen, said Annie, listen. The moon is a gray place, it's true, but the songs of the moon are plenty. Some are plain and some are fancy. But Suhela listened to them all, and through listening, she knew more than she had known before. So what I wanted to do with this book is to highlight three main themes. The first being our interconnectedness, the fact that we, just as my mama taught me, are all interconnected, that we um, are gifted in that there is a detectable, perceptible, and valuable um, common humanity, mom loved like Jung, you know, collective consciousness. She recognized the things that are the same in everyone, the same hopes and fears, the same dreams, the same insecurities. And so she worked to cultivate an understanding of that that was firm and very important in me and in my brother. And I'm quite convinced that, that it is that which guides him to continue to compromise and to work and to reach out even when it's hard. And the second theme is service. Again, young people are strong. They are not exempt from feeling the impact of things that happen in their world today. We need to talk to them and talk with them and listen carefully to them and to their stories and to um, be brave when the time is right. I don't think this is a book necessarily that um, has to, you know, is, is something that, you know, four-year-olds are going to open up and, and uh, you know, be able to recite or um, understand. My daughter's favorite part is the teacup because she likes the tea sets that she has and this idea of playing, you know, playing grown up and uh, being a host and being able to invite people to the table. And uh, they're cute, right? And so a child might be impacted initially just by the colors or a particular image, something that's, you know, the dog, the Aztec dog that Juji in her amazing illustrations brings to protect the boy when his great grandmother leaves him. But when the time comes, you can also open up discussions about um, our world and um, the things that have happened recently and the things that are happening today and how we can begin to cultivate a sense of resilience in ourselves and a desire to work together and to be peaceful. Um, and I think those are things that need to be taught early because at a, at, by the time that the kids come to me in high school, uh, it's frankly too late sometimes because certain habits of mind become entrenched. So if you want expansiveness, you have to start early. Having kids remember that it's never wise to other another <laughs> and, you know, and to build barriers, help them dissolve those barriers. And the third theme is, of course, you know, thinking about what we have inherited and uh, the things that came before us and uh, taking the best of that and making use of it in the future and not discarding, um, but using um, the worlds of the past 
while opening up uh, new possibilities for the future and thinking about what our mamas taught us or would have had they begin, been given the opportunity. I think about all that my mama um, missed and that saddens me, but I also know that in addition to the books and the toys that I can bring her spirit to bear um, in my conversations with my girls and that's a, a gorgeous gift and a blessed thing. Your grandma would wrap her arms around the world if she could. Together, step by step, they climbed that ladder in the path carved by the moon's glow. They swung the children round and round until they could all laugh again, loud and long. They'd build bridges and buildings and bonds between people. All these people who need us are people just like you and me. Do you see? All the boys and girls on the moon, all the men and women, were now part of the moon's hum. She sat for a quiet half moment, feeling proud for having helped others heal. Dear Mama, you worked hard all your life and you did your best. Now it's time to relax, let us do the rest. You used to scrub clothes by hand, way back home, work, work, work. That's all you did, even if it hurts your bones. Managing a restaurant, not your first choice. You wanted to plan birthdays, but your dream didn't come true. It just didn't happen. But you kept your head up and you kept on laughing. There's no limit to things you did. You raised me right. I'm a good kid. <laughs> I know I should thank you for all the gifts that you gave me, but I'm just thankful you're the one that raised me. Come, tell me everything. At night, you play piano. You play and play till your fingers are weak and the whole house has fallen deep into sleep. Through the music, I wake up, tiptoe down to you, sit on the bottom step. I'm under your spell, stuck to you like honey crusted over the jar. Come, tell me everything. Dad, you're the one that taught me life is fragile, like a thought or a dream. Everyone struggles, but the brave keep believing. You taught me life isn't easy. I saw the hard stuff you faced. And Dad, I have to say, even though you're not good at it, it's amazing how you stick to it. From everything you showed me, I'm going to save a life from the best of me. Come, tell me everything. Dear grandmother, do you remember that time when I was three, riding my tricycle in your backyard? I remember you cheering me on. And when I fell, you smiled and said, Mateo, get back up. Now that I'm a young man, I still fall off my bike sometimes. But when I do, I hear your words again. Mateo, get back up, son. Mateo, get back up. Come, tell me everything. I wish you could see me speak, moving an audience just like you did. You gave people that gift. Then you stopped remembering and lost yourself before you could see your granddaughter stepping into your footprints. I will take your memory, and I will fill rooms and theaters, and I want you to look down and smile. Come, tell me everything. They tell me you fiddled with my hair and did my nails on the beach of Santa Severa. You tickled my tummy and you dressed up my dolls. You sang with me all night long. Zia, magari saresti qui a vedere la donna che sono oggi. Come, tell me everything. I peeked around the curtain, knowing that I would never see your red baseball cap in the sea of people. I wish you were there when I stood on that creaky wooden stage, my heart pounding louder than the dusty old furnace. I poured my soul into that song, and I shined like a star. 
Come tell me everything Come tell me everything Come tell me everything She she knew before she knew more than 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 she knew she knew more than she knew before. That was amazing. You guys are um, indeed powerful. You are um, stronger than so many people realize. I hope that you are um, aware of how strong you are. And that was really incredible. Just some very basic things that help us to remember, I think, how to be peaceful. Just a few little things before we go to the Q&A. One is that, um, it is my hope that when we help our children to become aware of current events and to read the newspapers, that we have them read the newspapers from many different countries. One thing that I do is I have, because it's now available online, I have students go and look at the English language newspapers from many different countries on any given day, and you can see by the differences in how um, a story is written by the placement, by the priorities in the story. You can see how things are interpreted differently. I beg of you, please don't teach your children history from only one perspective. Um, I, there's no reason why we have to do that anymore. We can access multiple perspectives so easily, at a minimum two. One of the things that um, I started doing here in New York, but, but did much more in Hawaii later, were the exercises in empathy, where I had students reach back into history and write from the perspectives of those who are not featured in the textbooks, from the people in the shadows, in the margins, people who are underrepresented, and to write and research those lives in meaningful ways. You have to watch for anachronistic stuff, but um, you really get the kids to be researchers. These are sort of very basic things. I have, instead of debates, structured academic controversies, or basically you can have students debate one side, then flip it, debate the same argument from the other side and find a mediated um, perspective between the two. Resolve a conflict in writing and in thought, which will help them resolve conflicts in the world. Another thing that you can do is just don't tell them what side they have to debate until 15 minutes before the debate, and then they become less entrenched in their perspectives. Um, I think you know, of course, a little less emphasis on competition when possible, a little more on cooperation and on group work and the things that we can uh, do together. Um, I think that um, these are some basic things that I would like to see everyone doing um, and that can be done in every class and in every school, but also in every uh, home. And what you will find is that when you give students an opportunity to think a little bit about connecting their own lives to the lives of others, and those exercises in empathy, what I 
would do is I would have literally a bridge, draw a bridge along the side of one of your walls, take those big index cards, have them write in the voice of others, put them on the index card, that index card becomes a brick, and brick by brick you can build the bridge from wall to wall, and when students do that and they begin to do things like write journals, um, poetry, uh, um, uh, speeches, and mm, letters from the point of view of others who are far away, either receding in the past or geographically distant, is students begin to dissolve those boundaries on their own and they begin to find tremendous riches inside that they want to share um, with others and their voices are so strong and powerful and when those young people who were up here, and they're really so beautiful, nicely done, um, teach, one of the th things that is clear is that they are bridges, right, between, they mediate. Um, between perspectives. They know uh, what it means to be a child, but they also feel the spirit of you know, their elders, and, and they can move back and forth and shapeshift like that, and that's pretty cool. So anyway, thank you again for that enormous gift to me. You guys are cool.